بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, I would like to begin with uh, delivering to you a special salam from your brothers and sisters in Islam in Melbourne. MashaAllah, yani the brotherhood and the sisterhood there is very strong. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to unite us all upon goodness, upon Iman, and unite us all in the paradise. Ta'ala. Um, tonight with us is the third dhikr of Adhkar al Sabahi wal Masa. So we've done Ayatul Kursi and Al Mu'awwidat. And today's dhikr is found in Sahih Muslim. So it is authentic. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated and he said, Kana Nabiullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama idha amsa qal, amsayna wa amsa al mulku lillah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al mulku wa lahu alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. رَبِّ أَسْأَلُكَ خَيْرَ مَا فِي هَذِهِ اللَّيْلَةِ وَخَيْرَ مَا بَعْدَهَا وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا فِي هَذِهِ اللَّيْلَةِ وَشَرِّ مَا بَعْدَهَا رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْكَسَلِ وَسُوءِ الْكِبَرِ رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ عَذَابٍ فِي النَّارِ وَعَذَابٍ فِي الْقَبْرِ This is how the narration is. And then he said, وَإِذَا أَصْبَحَ قَالْ أَصْبَحْنَا وَأَصْبَحَ الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu he said that when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered the evening, he would say that dhikr. And when he entered the morning, he would say the same dhikr, but he would change a few words around. Instead of Amsayna wa Amsal Mulku Lillah, he would say Asbahna wa Asbah al Mulku Lillah, because that's more suited for the morning. And the evening you'd say Amsayna. And in the evening you would say Hadihi Layla, this night. And in the morning you'd say, هذا اليوم, this day. The beginning of the narration, he said, كان نبي الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أمسى قال. This كان إذا أمسى, this word كان, it implies commitment and steadfastness. يعني ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه is saying, every time there was a morning, and every time there is an evening, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would live to witness that morning and that evening, he would say, Ithan what we're learning is commitment and steadfastness upon a dhikr upon the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is exactly what the challenge of the believer is. It's not to pray once and to fast one Ramadan in your life and to give zakat once in your life or to do al-adhkar al-sabah al masa once a blue moon. La. The achievement in a deen is commitment and steadfastness. And this we learn it from Kana. And this is so much in a sunnah. Kana yaqul, he used to say, Kana yaf'al, he used to do such and such. Well, Sahaba radiallahu anhum were trained so well by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even in the most intense moments, they would never abandon their dhikr. One time, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam visits Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima radiallahu anha in her house. After she had requested from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to send her a slave to help in the house. So he went there and he said, O oh Fatima, shall I not teach you of something khayrun lakuma min khadam, better for you than a slave? Say subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times before you sleep. And that would be much better for you than a slave in the house. This dhikr will give you energy and power more than the slave would help you in the house. So Ali radiallahu anhu would say, I committed to this dhikr ever since the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me. He would say to the companions, فَمَا مُنذُ أو تعلمتمه تعلمتهن من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. 
I did not leave them ever since the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me. And then a companion said to him, Wala layla Safin, even on the night of Safin, Safin was the battle that happened between the Sahaba. He said, even on that night, imagine this is the most intense moment. This is a moment in where a person is in a battle, he's in an anxious state, in a worried state. He said to the Sahaba, even that night of the battle, I did not leave them. What are we learning from this? Commitment and steadfastness upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we want to learn. Kana, put a line there, put in your mind, commitment and steadfastness upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. Ida amsa, whenever he entered al masa, and we've already mentioned, and it's all right to revise it in one minute, that al masa is after al asr until maghrib. That's the preferred time for adhkarul masa, the evening. And if you miss it in the preferred time, the extended time is all the way until the end of the first third of the night. And as sabah the morning, we said it is after Fajr to sunrise. That is the preferred time. If you miss it in that time, then you have until just before Salat al-Dhuhr or Adhan al-Dhuhr. What would he say? He would say, Amsayna wa amsal mulku lillah. Now, of course, the original narration began with Amsayna wa Amsal Mulku Lillah. Why? Because in Islam, the night comes before the day, right? So, since the night comes before the day, the original narration mentioned that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he entered the evening, he would say the following dhikr, and it came with the evening terms at the beginning. So, Amsayna wa Amsal Mulku Lillah. Amsayna. Amsayna as a word on itself, would mean we have entered the afternoon. And in the morning, asbahna, we have entered the morning. What this means is we have entered the evening, we have entered the morning by the grace and the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what you're saying. When you say amsayna, and when you, we say asbahna, we are being grateful to Allah that he has extended our lives so that we witness yet another evening and another morning. There is praise, there is thanks, there is acknowledgement that Allah has extended my life. So I'm saying now, it's like Alhamdulillah, it's acknowledging that oh Allah, I know that I have entered the morning and the evening only by your permission and by your mercy and by your grace. وَأَمْسَى الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ And in the morning, وَأَصْبَحَ الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ Meaning, and as we enter the evening, and as we enter the morning, we acknowledge and have full and complete faith and belief that the entire kingdom belongs to Allah at this moment. This is wa amsal mulku lillah. I have no doubt at all that as I enter the evening, at this very moment, the entire kingdom belongs to you, O oh Allah. All matters. My health, my wealth, my family, my body, my abilities, my guidance, everything that surrounds me that I can see and I cannot see, I acknowledge at this very moment in the morning and in the evening that it all belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal. I'm saying now, wa amsal mulku lillah. It is an acknowledgement in the heart and an announcement on the tongue every morning and every evening that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And since Al-Mulk is for Allah, since everything belongs to Allah, that really means I don't own anything. Nothing at all. Since you have mentioned everything belongs to Him, that necessitates that you own nothing at all. Therefore, in the sight of Allah, you are poor. Allah Azza wa Jal states this as a fact in the Quran. Ya ayyuha nas He's not only speaking to believers, to all mankind. Antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu al-hamid. You are all poor and in desperate need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are in need of Him for your me existence. You're in need of Him for steadfastness upon Iman. You are in need of Him for provision and for protection and for healing. And every single matter and affair of your life, you are in need of Him. This is what you're thinking as you're saying, وَأَمْسَ الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ And in the morning, وَأَصْبَحَ الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ 
This word, al-mulku lillah, every morning and every evening teaches you and I humility. It teaches you the intense need you have for Allah Azza wa Jal. I can't do this day, O oh Allah. I can't do this evening without you aiding me and protecting me and supporting me and nurturing my iman and my steadfastness upon Islam. And if you don't own anything, when you said al-mulku lillah, meaning you don't own anything, that means why the arrogance against Allah Azza wa Jal? Therefore, al-mulku lillah, it's nurturing humility in the heart and at the same time, it's crushing arrogance in the heart. That's what it's doing. Because the more the humility is rising, the more and more the arrogance in the heart is being squashed and crushed. This is the effect of the name of Allah, Al-Malik. Al-Malik. This is the effect of this name. And yes, perhaps you own things in this life, but you don't have complete ownership over them. Allah Azza wa has given it to you for a short time. That's how we understand this concept between that and things that we actually own. I might look at you and say, this is my phone, I own it. Yeah, that's correct. But it's partial ownership. And that ownership was only there by Allah's permission. And this is why Allah Azza wa would say in Surah Maryam, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَرِثُ الْأَرْضَ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا وَإِلَيْنَا يُرْجَعُونَ We are the ones who نَرِثُ الْأَرْضِ نَرِثُ الْأَرْضِ meaning we cause death upon all things. And when everything is dead and destroyed, there is no one left to inherit the dead. So at that moment, Allah inherits all things and all things would be returned to Allah. وَإِلَيْنَا يُرْجَعُونَ Everything is returned to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why in Surah Al-Fatiha, when there is a reference to Yawm al-Din, the Day of Judgment, Allah's name, Maliki Yawm al-Din is mentioned. And in another recitation, Maliki Yawm al-Din, the owner of the Day of Judgment, the king of the Day of Judgment. Why is that name brought as opposed to the other 99 names that we know about Allah? Because on the Day of Judgment, His name Al-Malik, his name, the owner, his name, the king, becomes apparent and very clear for everyone to see. Everyone will see it. So, Maliki Yawm al-Din. And Allah Azza wa Jal would even say about that day, وَالْأَمْرُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلَّهِ Every matter belongs to Allah. And we already took and covered in Ayat al-Kursi about al shafaa And we said, you don't even have permission to open your mouth and to speak a word without Allah's permission. You see how much ownership there is on that day? That it is so exposed, everyone can see how Allah Azza wa Jal owns all things. The believer needs to think like this now. Over there, everyone will think like this. Don't worry, there's no, your iman is not tested on that day because everything is seen. But now, as you read, وَأَصْبَحَ الْمُلْكُ لِلَّهِ These meanings need to penetrate deep inside the heart. So after we've acknowledged amsayna or asbahna, after we've acknowledged that we have only entered the evening and the morning by Allah's permission and by His grace and mercy. And after we, has, we have acknowledged that all the kingdom belongs to Him, we now say, Walhamdulillah. I'm saying now, I'm saying, Mulkulillah. Walhamdulillah. Walhamdulillah. All praise and thanks belongs to Him. No one else. Because this Walhamdulillah, you see that lamb on Allah. That there is known as Lamul Ikhtisas, the Lamb of exclusivity. What that means is that praise and thanks exclusively belongs to Allah and no one else. This is what it means. That Lamb, it creates this meaning. And so we say Alhamdulillah. But in context of what we had just said, what does this Alhamdulillah mean? What is it referring to? We are saying Alhamdulillah for the two matters that we have already said. So when you said Amsayna, we have entered the morning, you are saying Alhamdulillah for that. Alhamdulillah for the fact that Allah has allowed us to lit, live and witness yet another evening and another morning. Then Alhamdulillah is praising Allah for that blessing, that He has extended your life. And Alhamdulillah, praising Allah is also for the second fact, and that is Al Mulku Lillah. You are praising and thanking Allah that the kingdom belongs to him and no one else. Alhamdulillah, that the kingdom belongs to him and no one else. You know why? Because if the kingdom belonged in someone else's hand, 
Allah Azza wa Jal said what would have happened. In Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal said, قُلْ لَوْ أَنْتُمْ تَمْلِكُونَ خَزَائِنَ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّي إِذَا لَأَمْسَكْتُمْ خَشْيَةَ الْإِنْفَاقِ وَكَانَ الْإِنْسَانُ قَطُورًا Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, if you people were to possess the treasures of the mercy of Allah, if the kingdom was in your, if it was in your hands, you know what would have happened? Then you would have withheld out of fear of spending. No one would have given anyone anything. And as a result, the kingdom that would have been in this person's hand, everyone would have starved and suffered. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ قَطُورًا And the human being has always been stingy and miserly when it comes to spending. This is the nature of human being. This is why this quality needs to be, you need to fight this quality by continuously giving. So the idea was, we're thinking, Alhamdulillah, that the kingdom belonged to him because Allah Azza wa Jal provides for all his creation, animals, humans. He, he provides to them from his kingdom. He provides to the slaves that obey him, to the most disobedient slaves. He provides for all. And he continues to provide for them. And every moment of their life, he continues to provide for them. Non-stop. Subhanallah. فَإِذَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ That the kingdom was in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word, وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ What does it mean? The essence of alhamd is to praise Allah with love and to thank Him with love. If love is missing, that is not complete hamd. That's deficient, fake hamd. The proper hamd of Allah is to praise Him and to thank Him with sincere, honest, genuine love. And alhamd is these two things, praising Allah and thanking Allah. And why do we say two things? They're different. Because sometimes you can praise certain things, but not necessarily thank them. You might praise uh, a nice building, but you don't thank the building. And you might thank someone, perhaps an enemy of yours, that had done a favor for you. So you find that it's necessary that I thank him, but you don't praise him at all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praised for his names, for his attributes, for his actions. He's praised for every decree, whether it's good or bad. And at the same time, he is thanked for everything that he has decreed for mankind. Both together. This is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, if you understand it, and it enters your heart, you go through any calamity in life with ease. You don't suffer as a result of your calamity. Because all praise and thanks truly belongs to Allah with love from my heart for any situation I'm in. Whether I'm sick or I'm poor or I'm suffering, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Walhamdulillah. Walhamdulillah has two meanings. The first is that all praise and thanks belongs to Allah. What that means is that if there's anyone on this earth or anything on this world that is being praised by the people, then that praise actually belongs to Allah because that thing was only praised by Allah's permission. Yani, what does this mean? You know, if you see someone being praised, MashaAllah, this man has beautiful character, beautiful manners, MashaAllah, he is generous, and the people are praising him. Then Alhamdulillah means that even though people are praising him, that praise actually belongs to Allah because he only was praised by Allah's permission. This is what Alhamdulillah means. Meaning anything on earth that is praised, anything on earth that is praised, the praise of that thing actually belongs to Allah because it was only praised by Allah's permission. That's the first meaning of Alhamdulillah. And the other meaning of Alhamdulillah is that the complete and perfect praise belongs to Allah in every single way, for every single moment and for every single situation. Whether it's a good decree upon you or a bad decree, whatever it is, all of it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is praised for his names, for all his attributes, for all his actions, for all his decrees. And the praise is perfect and complete. This is what Alhamdulillah is. And you know, because Alhamd has a huge meaning. The first one to praise Allah was who? Hmm? Adam. 
the first one to praise Allah was Allah himself. He's the one who praised himself. Because no one can praise him the way he deserves except him. So he said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And the Quran began with this. And this is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say in his dua, La uhsi thana'an alayk, anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. He would say, I cannot praise you enough. You are as you have praised yourself. <clears throat> so now, since you have acknowledged that it is by the permission and by the mercy and by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, So now, since you have acknowledged that it is by the mercy and the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal that you have reached the morning and reached the evening and that the kingdom belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this necessitates, it necessarily means that all worship belongs to him. As a result, the second part of a dhikr was la ilaha illallah. This is what came straight after walhamdulillah. Now you acknowledge and you announce with your tongue that obedience and servitude and worship all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you've said, Amsayna wa amsal mulku lillah wa alhamdulillah wa la ilaha illa Allah. You say, la ilaha illa Allah. And this is the word of a tawheed. We've repeated it many times. We've said this means that there is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah. And I informed you before that at tawheed is the central message of the morning and evening adhkar. It is the central message. It is the theme. And it is also the theme of al-adhan. It is the theme and the central message of our salat. It is the theme of the adhkar after the prayers. It is the theme of the adhkar before we sleep. And it is the theme and the central message of the adhkar when we wake up. This is it. La ilaha illallah is everywhere. So why are we saying it so many times during the day and during the night? Can you imagine? Ayat al-Kursi, we've already said, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. Surah al-Ikhlas, we've already said, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, wal mu'awwithat. And now this dhikr, Amsayna wa amsal mulku lillah, walhamdulillah, La ilaha illa Allah. Why? Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ الْإِيمَانِ لَيَخْلَقُ فِي جَوْفِ أَحَدِكُمْ كَمَا يَخْلَقُ الثَّوْبِ فَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ يُجَدِّدَ الْإِيمَانَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives us a fact. He says that al-Iman, it tears and it wears away inside of any one of you. He's, that's the calamity, that it's inside of us. We cannot see it being worn and torn away. If an iman was outside, it would have been easy. We could have just said, brother, look, your iman's running down. Go and fix it. But it's inside. No one can see it. And I can't see inside as well. That's the calamity. So what do we do as a result? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says an iman, it tears and wears away in the same manner clothing tears away. And when people's clothing becomes old and it tears and it wears, they throw it, get rid of it, buy a new one. You, you renew your clothes. So in the same manner, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then ask Allah that he renews and replenishes this iman of yours. Therefore, renewing iman is one of the most essential matters that the believer is supposed to be doing during the day and during the night. And iman is based upon this word. Iman is la ilaha illallah. And this is why this word is repeated so often during the day and during the night. You're renewing your contract with Allah every time you say, La ilaha illallah. That He's the only Lord worthy of worship. And there is no Lord worthy of worship besides Him at all. So you keep repeating it. And as you repeat it, you are asking Allah to renew an iman in your heart. You see, renewing, asking Allah to renew iman in your heart doesn't just mean to sit down. Oh Allah, renew Iman in my heart. It means get up and do the actions that renew Iman in your heart. Such as reading al adhkar saying La ilaha illallah, praying, reading Al-Quran, memorizing Quran, 
all of these actions renew the iman in the heart. La ilaha illallah is made up of two parts. These two parts are known as rukna at-tawheed, two pillars of at-tawheed. If one is missing in your life, your tawheed is invalid, rejected. Such a person, if he dies like this, ends up in the hellfire. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. Therefore, this is important knowledge. What are the two pillars of at-tawheed? Al-ulama rahimahumullah would say very simple, al-nafyu wal-ithbat. There is affirmation and there is negation. So affirmation, is to, it begins first with the negation. When you say, la ilah, la ilah means there is no Lord worthy of worship at all. That's negation. And then the affirmation part is to say, illallah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important because look, even in English, if I was to say to you now, Adam is eating, does that mean only he's eating? It could mean others are eating. If I said Adam is eating, it doesn't mean that others are not eating. But if I said no one is eating except Adam, halas, that means no one is eating at all except him. And so therefore, you cannot just say Allah is one and stop there. You need to say there is no Lord except Allah. There is no Lord worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And due to the importance of these two pillars of At-Tawheed, it was emphasized, these two pillars were emphasized once again in the same dhikr, in the words that follow. What's next? We say, Amsayna, wa amsa al mulku lillah, wa alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah. What's wahdahu la sharika lah? It is affirming the same two pillars we just spoke about. Wahdahu means alone, alone. And this wahdahu is an emphasis of illallah. So, illallah wahdahu. And la sharika lah, there are no partners to him at all, is emphasizing what? The negation part, which is la ilah, right? So, therefore, we have la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. These two, two separate statements, both of them have affirmation and negation, affirmation and negation. And wahdahu la sharika lah was said after la ilaha illallah to confirm and reaffirm and solidify in the heart of the believer these two conditions of a tawheed. Now, after this, there is lahu al mulku wa lahu al hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. How does this fit into everything we have? Now, there's something also very important and crucial to know. We spoke about the two pillars of a tawheed But I want to address now the two types of a tawheed There are two types of tawheed And these two types of a tawheed It is very necessary for the believer to embrace both of them. The first, as al ulama, I'll explain and then I'll show you how this fits into the dhikr so you can understand where these words are coming from. Two types of a tawheed The first type is known as a tawheed al-ilmi. And there is something known as a Tawheed al-Amali. Is that easy? Tawheed al-Ilmi, Tawheed al-Amali. Tawheed al-Ilmi means the Tawheed of knowledge and belief. And Tawheed al-Amali is the Tawheed of action and implementation. Tawheed al-Ilmi is also known as Tawheed al-Ma'rifati wal-Ithbat. And Tawheed al-Amali is known as Tawheed al-Qasdi wa talab don't confuse, you don't have to memorize these extra names. But you want to keep it simple? Tawheed ilmi, Tawheed amali. There is Tawheed of knowledge and belief and Tawheed of action and implementation. What is all this? Very simple. When you know Allah through His names and His attributes and His actions, then this is the Tawheed al-ilmi, the Tawheed of knowledge and belief. So things like that have passed us in this dhikr so far, al-mulku lillah, that is part of a tawheed al-ilmi, that's knowledge about Allah that all kingdom belongs to him. And the words that are coming up once again, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. He is capable over all things. And the, to him belongs the kingdom repeated again. All that is under which category? 
التوحيد العلمي the توحيد of knowledge and belief the other type of توحيد التوحيد العملي the توحيد of implementation and action and this is the middle part لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له توحيد العملي means the actual worship of Allah when you're worshiping Allah alone now you're engaging in a tawheed al-amali when you pray and your salat is only for Allah now you've engaged in a tawheed al-amali when you fast and your fasting is only for Allah when you give zakat and your zakat is only for Allah when you read Quran and your recitation is only for Allah you're engaging in tawheed of the action and implementation and that's beautiful because so far from the beginning of the dhikr until now we cover these two parts so we got amsayna wa amsa al-mulku lillahi walhamdulillah that covers tawhid al-ilmi then there is la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah tawhid al-amali lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir tawhid al-ilmi so we got tawhid ilmi tawhid ilmi and in the middle we have tawhid amali my brothers and sisters in Islam, at Tawheed al Amali or Tawheed al Ilmi is also Tawheed al Rububiyyah, the Lordship. But at Tawheed al Ilmi is the knowledge of Allah Azzawajal's names and attributes, right? It's that knowledge. Now, what is the relationship between these two types of Tawheed? Very simple. One leads to another. That's it. At Tawheed al Ilmi, the Tawheed of knowledge and belief, leads to Tawheed al Amali. It leads to the Tawheed of action and implementation. What Tawheed of knowledge and belief is proof of why you should be engaged in a Tawheed al-Amali and to embrace the Tawheed of implementation and action. When you have knowledge and certain belief that all praise belongs to Allah and that the kingdom is for Him, everything belongs to Him, and that huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir, everything belongs to Him, if you have this knowledge, then it necessitates that you sincerely declare the oneness of Allah and disassociate yourself from any form of shirk and that you devote yourself completely to his worship and his obedience. My brothers and sisters in Islam, that is the first half of a dhikr. This was a complete and a perfect praise of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now comes the dua part. And I've always mentioned that we've said that the best and most accepted type of dua is the dua which begins with a tawassul ila Allah, the dua that begins by seeking a way to Allah Azza wa Jal. And you can seek a way to Allah through many things. Yani you can seek a way to Allah through your good deeds. For example, if you said, Oh Allah, I ask you through the night prayer that I prayed five years ago, and I had prayed it sincerely for your sake, if you know I prayed it sincerely for your sake, then relieve me from my calamity. That's permissible in Islam. That is a tawassul. You're getting through to Allah through a righteous deed that you did. And you can call to Allah, you can seek a way to Allah through His names and attributes by saying, Ya Rahman, and then forgive me or have mercy upon me. And you can also seek a way through to Allah, and this is the best of them all, through your tawheed. The best way, the best way to seek a way to Allah is through your Tawheed. To ask Allah, Oh Allah, the fact that I believe in your oneness, forgive me or accept from me or whatever dua you want to say, right? And this is beautiful here because this is exactly what is happening. Before this dua begins, you have just sought a way to Allah Azza wa Jal through a tawheed. When you said, I'm saying, I'm saying, Mulku lillah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah. For this, this puts your dua in the absolute best position of it being accepted. Beautiful. How beautiful is this? And what's more beautiful is to know this, and now you look forward to repeating this dhikr every morning and every evening. So we're saying here, uh, I ask, I ask you through the fact that I acknowledge that you, the, you are the owner of all your creation, al-mulku lillah, and that all praise belongs to you, and you are capable of all things, and that you are the one 
to be worshipped because you are one in your lordship and to you belongs the best names and attributes and now you want to say your dua we say Rabbi as'aluka khayra ma fi hadha al-yawm wa khayra ma ba'dahu but then notice the first word here in a dua is what Rabbi 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 means my lord there is no ya Rabbi it's Rabbi But the word Rabbi, it's asking Allah through his rububiyyah, through his lordship. Because the word Ar-Rabb highlights the rububiyyah of Allah. And the rububiyyah of Allah, which is the lordship, is of two types. And this is very important to understand. I'll bring it all to you at the end. Ar-Rububiyyah is two types. There is something known as rububiyyatun amma and rububiyyah khasa. There is a general lordship of Allah. And there is a specific lordship. What is the difference? General lordship, this is for all the creation of Allah. General rububiyah means, this is what it means, that Allah created all the creation and he provides for them and he takes care of them, he sustains them, he provides them, provides for them, he nurtures them, all of them, animals, jinn, angels, mankind, believer, disbeliever, everyone is affected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's general rububiyyah. And al-rububiyyah al-khassah, the specific lordship, this is only for the believers. And what does it mean? It means that Allah nurtures and he maintains the believers' iman. He nurtures their iman in their heart. He plants the seed of iman in their heart and he nurtures it for them. And he grants them success and commitment and steadfastness upon worship and obedience. This is ar rububiyah al-khassah. It is only for believers. ar rububiyah al-'am is for everyone. That Allah nurtures and looks after everyone. But ar rububiyah al-khassah is specifically Allah nurturing and looking after the iman that is in the heart of a believer. So when we're saying here, Rabbi as'aluk, we are asking Allah through this special type of lordship. As you say, Rabbi As'aluk, you are asking Allah Azza wa Jal to maintain and to preserve the Iman that's within you and to continue to nurture it for you and to keep you steadfast and committed upon an Iman wal Islam. Now, watch what is beautiful here. You have now, with this word Rabbi and everything before it, you have now done tawassul to Allah, you sought a way to Allah through the three types of Tawheed which is Al-Uluhiyyah, Al-Rububiyyah, Wal-Asma, Wal-Sifat. Al-Uluhiyyah, it's La ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lah. Al-Rububiyyah is the word Rabbi. Wal-Asma, Wal-Sifat, Al-Mulk, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. That's exactly what is found in Surah Al-Fatiha. Before we said, Ihdina al-Salat al-Mustaqeem, we asked Allah Azza wa Jal through His Uluhiyyah, His Oneness, His Lordship, and through His names and attributes. When we said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawm al and we did the same thing where in Al-Mu'awwidhat, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَحَدْ قُلْ عَنْ رَبِّ الْفَلَقْ وَقُلْ عَضُوا رَبِّ النَّاسِ Now comes the dua. And this is why the dua of the prophets was always Rabbi. Rabbi. And you know, Rabbi here, the Ya Rabbi is omitted. There is no Ya. So instead of Oh my Lord, it is actually my Lord. There is no O at the beginning. What does this imply? This implies closeness. When we're saying, Rabbi as'aluka, as you're saying this, the believer is recognizing his closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because, if, let's say someone's close to me, I'd say, Ahmed. But if someone's far, I'd say, Ya Ahmed. I'd call out when there's someone far. So the fact that we said, Rabbi as'aluka, it implies that Allah is close. And that's the fact. And of course, on this point here, there is no issue if you were to say, Ya Rabbi, right? But in this dhikr here, you don't, because it was narrated without Ya. So you'll just say, Rabbi as'aluka khayra ma fi hadhihi al-laylati wa khayra ma ba'daha. My Lord, I ask you the best of this night and the nights that follow. And I ask you the best of this morning and the mornings that follow. I ask you the best of the, what does that mean? As'aluka khayra ma fi hadhi al-layla. Meaning I ask you the best of that which you have decreed for your righteous believers this night and this morning. 
And what is the good that Allah decrees every morning and every evening? What are they? Righteous deeds. Allah decrees them every morning and every evening. He decrees lawful sustenance and provision. He decrees protection in Iman. He decrees protection of wealth and health, safety, security, blessings that come down in the morning and in the evenings. These are all good matters that Allah decrees every day and every night. So when you say, Rabbi as'aluka khayra ma fi hadhihi al-laylati wa khayra ma ba'daha, you are saying, oh Allah, you're saying, my Lord, I ask you, from all the good that you have decreed this night and the night that follows, and if you said it in the morning, this day and the day that follows, you're asking Allah to give you all this goodness that is decreed, because it is definitely decreed, it's coming down. So Allah, I don't want to miss out. Give me from that good that you have already sent and decreed down. Don't make me miss out from this good. And you're saying, خَيْرَ مَا فِي هَذِي I just gave you examples. Otherwise, the goodness is many types. This is why this is a beautiful du'a, because it's very general and comprehensive. It includes the khayr, the goodness that you know about, and the goodness that you do not know about. وَخَيْرَ مَا بَعْدَهَا And you're securing for the next night and the next day. And oh Allah, the goodness of the next day and the next night. And then we say, وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا فِي هَذِهِ اللَّيْلَةِ وَشَرِّ مَا بَعْدَهَا And oh Allah, I seek your protection from the evil that you have decreed during this night and the night that follows. And if you said it in the morning, then the evils of this day and the days that follow. What is evil? What is the evil and the harm that Allah decrees every morning and every evening? Sicknesses, diseases, sins, evil, oppression, fitan, everything that you're worried and you're afraid of, devils, magic, evil eye, accidents, and so on. These are the evils that Allah decrees every morning and evening. So when you say, وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا فِي هَذِهِ اللَّيْلَةِ وَشَرِّ مَا بَعْدَهَا You're asking Allah to protect you from the evils that have been decreed for this night and the nights that follow. And we've already explained at ta'awudh and what it means, and we elaborated on this, to run to the one who can protect you, and that is Allah. أَعُوذُ meaning I seek shelter and protection and cover with the one who can provide this. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I told you about the goodnesses that are decreed during the day and the night, and the evil that are decreed during the day and during the night. And this is a hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sleeping one night. So he got up from his sleep, he had seen a dream, and he said, subhanallah. And this is a sunnah, if someone saw a disturbing dream or something that amazes him, that he says, Subhanallah. Then he said, Mada unzil al laylata min al fitan? Mada unzil min al khazain? He said, and he's amazed and surprised, what has come down today of the fitan? Fitan meaning punishments. And fitan was used because fitan are a means for the punishments. So he said, he woke up. He woke up worried. And he said, what has come down tonight from the punishments of Allah? Sicknesses, diseases, earthquakes, Allahu Alam, what happened that night? And then he said, وَمَاذَا أُنزِلَ مِنَ الْخَزَائِنِ And he's surprised as well. He's saying, what has also come down from the mercy and the blessings of Allah this very night? And then he said, مَنْ يُوْقِذُ صَوَاحِبَ الْحُجُرَاتِ Who wake up my wives? Get up and wake up my wives from their beds. Wake up. He woke them up. He woke them up. Why? Punishments were coming down. And I said to you, punishments are decreed. They come down during the night and during the day. And when you're asking Allah to save you from the evils of that night, you're asking Allah to save you from the evils that can happen and decree that night. And when you ask Allah for the goodness of the day and the night, you're asking Allah for the goodness that He has sent down and decreed. Like that night that happened in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He saw in a dream that evil came down. Punishment came down and he saw blessings and mercy came down. So he said to the wives, get up and pray. What does that mean? He said to them, get up and pray so that they can be the first people to seek Allah's protection from the evil that came down that night. And to get up and pray so that they can earn something of the goodness that has come down that night as well. So that they don't miss out. 
Dun misa, every night there's goodness coming. And the believer is supposed to seek ways. How does he earn this goodness? How does he get a share and a portion of it? Not when you're sleeping. Maybe if you're awake, that's a means of earning something of the goodness that comes down that night. Reading Al-Adhkar al-Sabah al-Masa and saying this dhikr is a means of taking a share of this goodness and keeping away the harm and the evil from yourself. Very important this dhikr. Naam. And it's as though a message to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though your, your husband is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't depend on him. Get up and work for yourself and pray for yourself and make dua for yourself that Allah azza wa jal save you from the fitan and that he give you of the goodness that was revealed and sent down that night. And this hadith also refers to the fact that as salat provides protection. It's a source of protection for a person from al-fitan. Then we say, this is the ending of this dhikr. Let's look at this. Yani, the last thing we said is to seek Allah's protection from what? From the evil of that evening or that morning. Now, a list of evils are being mentioned. My Lord, I seek your protection. Protect me and save me from kasal. Kasal. What's kasal? Laziness. Imagine this. Every morning and evening, we are asking Allah to save us from laziness. And this in itself is a proof that kasal, laziness, is a huge and a terrible sickness of the heart. It leads a person to destruction if you allow laziness to get the better of you. What is laziness? There is another hadith that will come with us in Adhkar al-Sabah al-Masa'in where we say, Allahumma inni a'udhu wika min al-ajz wal-kasal. Then what's the difference between al-ajz al-kasal? Because when you know the difference, then you know exactly what al-kasal is. Al-kasal is translated as laziness. And laziness is when the limbs are able, you have full function of your limbs and your body, but the heart is not interested. The heart doesn't have the drive, doesn't have the passion, doesn't have the motivation, doesn't have the inspiration, doesn't have the desire to do the good. Such a person is not excused in the sight of Allah Azza This is what kasal is. Kasal is, you're in your full health. Walhamdulillah, ability, you have good ability. But inside here, there's no drive. That's kasal. It's like the heart has died. This is, this is an evil trait. You're seeking Allah's protection from it. Rabbi a'udhu bika min al-kasal. And so this is why it's always important to ask Allah to seek His help for worship. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'een. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrik. Give me the ability. Help me that I continue in your worship. Ula hawla wa la quwata illa billah is an excellent dhikr to remove al-kasal from the heart. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah is the best dhikr when you're seeking Allah's help concerning your worship and your steadfastness upon Iman. Wal-ajaz, which is opposite to kasal, al-ajaz is inability. This is when the limbs are unable, such as that a person is perhaps disabled or is sick of some sort, but the heart is able. The heart has the drive. It has the motivation. It has the inspiration. You know, like someone that has severe diabetes. Right? This is ajaz. <laughs> Because now, if he wants to fast, he cannot fast. He has the drive, he wants to, but he can't. Such a person is excused in the sight of Allah, and a person like this is rewarded. Perhaps someone paralyzed. He wants to do hajj. He's got that energy. He wants to go. But his body is unable. He's unable to do so. That's what, that's called al-ajaz. So al-kasal is terrible. Well, ajaz is something that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would also seek Allah's protection from, right? So we ask Allah azza wa jal to protect us from al-ajzi wal kasal. Subhanallah, laziness. This is what keeps mankind away from the goodness and from righteous deeds and from obedience. These are things that bring closer, bring a person closer to Allah. Al-kasal, you'll find the major reason in many people's lives that has kept them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wasu'il kibar. 
This word Su'il Kibar has been narrated in two ways. Su'il Kibar and Su'il Kibr. There are two ways. Even though Su'il Kibar is the more often narrated narration, and this is where more the ahadith are pointing towards, but Al Kibr has also been mentioned and narrated authentically. And what do you do here? Perhaps sometimes you say Su'il Kibar and sometimes say Su'il Kibr, right? Su'il Kibar, let's look at the common narration. And we're also seeking Allah's protection from the misery and agony of old age. Su'il Kibar, Al Kibar is old age. And there is misery and agony and suffering concerning old age, such as the weakness, the fragile body, the eyesight is losing eyesight, loss of hearing, the bones are weak, like Zakaria would say, Wahan al Avmu minni. Zakaria alayhi salam, my bones have become very frail and weak. At that old age, there is memory loss, a lack of understanding. Perhaps a person cannot even recognize his own family members. Dementia starts coming in. Alzheimer's, actually, the Alzheimer's is the worst type of dementia. A person becomes like a child in his dealings, in his behavior. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ أَرْضَ الْعُمُرِ And some of you are returned to أَرْضَ الْعُمُرِ أَرْضَ الْعُمُرِ الْأَرْضَ is the matters that are undesired due to their terrible nature. Meaning a person goes back to that age in where he acts like a child. Su'il al-kibar, the misery of old age is a calamity. Yani, the misery and agony of old age can become so intense on a person that he becomes a burden on others. And his manners change and his behavior is affected. And he begins to swear and curse and insult others and forgets his prayers, forgets, we ask Allah Azza wa to save us. So when you're asking Allah in this dua every morning and evening, al kibar, you're saying, Oh Allah, my Lord, protect me from the misery and the suffering of old age. That Oh Allah, if you granted me life until I reach old age, then save me from the sufferings that come with it. Keep my mind and my sanity with me. Keep my power with me. Give me that ability that I continue worshipping you. And at the same time, as you are seeking Allah's protection from the sufferings of old age, at the very same time, you are asking him indirectly that he grant you good health. Because if you're asking him to protect you from the sufferings of old age, meaning what? Meaning grant me goodness and strength, good health during old age. If Allah Azza wa was to give you that long life and give me and grant me the ability that I continue to remember your worship and remember you subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are asking Allah Azza wa to make you from those who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, خَيُوكُمْ مَنْ طَالَ عُمُرُهُ وَحَسُنْ عَمَلُهُ The best of you are those who live long and their entire life is filled with goodness. طيب. The next narration is وَسُوءِ الْكِبْرِ And the evil of arrogance. You're asking Allah to protect you from the evil of arrogance. And arrogance is two things. As the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بَطَرُ الْحَقِّ وَغَمْطُ النَّاسِ the first thing arrogance is, is to reject the truth. Like Iblis, when he was told to make sajda for Adam, he rejected the truth. That was the truth, he should have done it. He rejected it, right? Anyone, anyone who rejects any ayah, or any hadith, or any instruction from Allah, it could be the smallest instruction. Kibr, finished. No question about it. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ سُلْطَانٍ أَتَاهُمْ إِنْ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ إِلَّا كِبْرٌ مَا هُمْ بِبَالِغِهِ Allah Azza wa Jal says, anyone who disputes concerning the ayat of Allah without any authority, without any authority to do so, then indeed there is kibr in his heart. There is arrogance and pride. See, any truth that comes to you, you accept it. So we're asking Allah Azza wa Jal here to protect us from al-kibr, su'il kibr, which is batar al-haq, rejecting the truth. And the second type of kibr is ghamtu nas belittling the people. And that's exactly what Iblis did when he claimed that he was better than Adam. He did this. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it is enough of a huge sin for a person to belittle his brother. Yani, if you wanted to know what's a big sin, 
belittling, belittling a brother or a sister of yours, it is enough of a sin. Yani you have too many sins if you do that. This is arrogance if you do that. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, none shall enter the paradise and in his heart is an at, is a ant's weight of pride and arrogance. Crucial. That's why Iblis was thrown out of Jahannam, uh, thrown out of the paradise immediately. Because as soon as his kibir manifested, he was removed. Because the paradise is not a place to display arrogance. He was removed instantly. And that's the law from then has been the same. No one will enter the paradise if he has an ant's weight of kibir in his heart. Tayyip, look at this. Evil of arrogance. Wasu'il kibr. What does that mean? Does that mean there is good kibr and evil kibr? Well, yes. That's what the wording suggests. When we say, Allah, save us and protect us from evil, arrogance and pride. That means there is a good type of arrogance and pride. Now, and what is that? Does anyone know? What's the good type of arrogance? Al-Mujahid fi sabilillah. This came from a narration that Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu on the day of Uhud, he took a bandana, a red bandana, and he tied it on his head and he began to walk muhtanun fi mishyatihi, walking an arrogant, prideful walk. How do you define a prideful, arrogant walk? It is the walk like how the soldiers would march in a military march. March. When the hands are going up and the foot is stomping the ground and the head is raised in the sky. That is the arrogant, prideful walk. That of course Allah Azza wa does not like this. Allah Azza wa said, وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولًا Allah Azza wa said, do not walk like this because you will not break you will not be able to split the earth with your stomping on the ground and you will not be able to reach the mountains as you look up in the sky and walk. So Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu on the day of Uhud walked this kind of walk that I described too. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is a walk that is hated by Allah except in a moment like this. Now, this dua or this hadith is weak. It is weak. And so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say such a thing, but I narrated it and I tell you it's a weak hadith because it is very common among the people. And as a matter of fact, every hadith concerning the prideful, arrogant walk in jihad are all weak. So now, is this walk in jihad permissible or not? Yes, it is. In consensus, have mentioned that this type of walk is permissible in a war. Why? Because there is great benefit to it. It shows the strength of the believers and it encourages the believers among each other. And at the same time, it instills fee in the enemy of Allah Azza wa And as a result, there's great benefit for it. There's great benefit for Islam. Therefore, it is permissible only in a moment like this. And some other ulama would mention that even if a person was in a position of a da'wah, and he was delivering a message to people that are arrogant, and he stood with arrogance and pride, and he delivered Allah's message, then that's also doing the same job as a mujahid. It is elevating the word of Allah, that's permissible in that regard. So this is known as husnil kibar, husnil kibar. You see that? Something that Allah hates became loved when it is for the sake of raising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word and his deen, subhanallah. And if you understood this, my brothers and sisters in Islam, I want to bring your attention to something that has become very common among communities and societies, Muslim communities and societies today. If you understood this, you will know why it's wrong and impermissible to share clips and pictures of our brothers and sisters in Islam that are being killed and bombed and injured. Haram, it is not allowed. You cannot use these videos and pictures in order to encourage people to donate money or for any other cause or to spread awareness, let's just spread out these videos. Let's show the Ummah how it's being killed, their blood being spilt, their bones and their limbs being thrown all over the place, their injuries, their cries, their wails, their screamings. 
Ya Allah, let's just share it and show everyone our weakness. It is impermissible. Why is it impermissible? Because of two things. It weakens al-Islam. You are showing people the weakness. People now are seeing the weakness of Islam. And it is not allowed for the believers to expose their weakness to their enemy. It is not allowed. Yani al-haram, which is that prideful walk, became permissible because it's raising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word. This is impermissible, as al-ulama rahimahumullah would mention. And at the same time, it doesn't only expose our weakness. Us, as believers among each other, there are some Muslims that become afraid. They lose hope in Allah. They lose hope in the mercy of Allah. They lose hope in the victory of Allah. For as a result, we have cast the doubt in our own brothers and sisters. There is no goodness in it whatsoever, left or right. And some would say, Wallah, we do this to spread awareness. We use it so we can collect whatever it is, donations. Khalat, wrong. The ayat of Allah are enough to inspire the believer to give sadaqat. The ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are more than enough to inspire us. What am I going to do if the people don't understand their deen? I'll bend it and twist and go with them and say, Allah, khalas, khalas, that's all right, no worries. If people are ignorant, someone needs to come saying, stop. Don't share these videos. Don't share these images. If you reach it, delete it. Don't even look at it. A dua for your brothers and sisters in Islam. This is what would benefit them. Sharing videos and clips of their injuries and their cries and suffering Wallah is an insult to their honor. It's an insult to their dignity. Wallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَعُهَا أَذَى A good word and a forgiveness is better than a sadaqah that is followed up with insult. Yani if I give someone a thousand dollars and I abuse him, that is terrible. It would have been better for you to just say, may Allah provide for you. If you just said that and walked away, it would have been a million times better than giving him something and insulting him. And when you expose a believer's suffering, and when you expose a believer's poverty and poorness, you are insulting him. You are abusing him. Because, you know what? My honor is more important than, to me than my stomach. I don't care about my stomach. I don't care about my hunger. My honor is more important. I'd rather die and starve to death than appearing in front of the world begging so that they can, what? Under the assumption of let's encourage the people to give. This is wrong. Absolutely wrong. For we keep away from it, my brothers and sisters in Islam. We ask Allah Azza wa to give us an understanding of our deen. And the final part, we're coming to the end. Rabbi a'udhu bika min adhabin fil nar wa adhabin fil qabr. And by the way, and I shared this point with you to say that you know, At-Tawalli Yawm Az-Zahf. Have you heard of this? At-Tawalli Yawm Az-Zahf. Who's heard of it? At-Tawalli Yawm Az-Zahf is a major sin. What it means is that if the believers are on the battlegrounds and they are fighting the enemy, if a believer decides to turn his back and run away, that's a major sin. Terrible major sin. Why? Because when he turns his back and runs away, he's exposing weakness of the Muslims. The enemy would look, ah, like they're running away. So they become strong. Ya Allah, let's get, get to them. And if he runs away, other believers will, why is he running away? I'm going to run away with him. And the whole, everything becomes weak and it falls and it crumbles. That's why it was a major sin. Huh? Understand, exposing the weakness of Muslims is no good. It is terrible. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. Last part. My Lord, I seek your protection from the punishment of the fire and the punishment of the grave. These two punishments are the punishments of the afterlife. Meaning after a person dies, this is when he sees these punishments. They become possible after his death. Why were these two mentioned specifically? Even though there are many forms of punishments after a person dies, they were mentioned because number one, they are the worst of punishments. The grave and the hellfire. And the other thing is that the grave is the first of the punishments and the hellfire is the last of the punishments. Whoever is saved from the punishment of the grief, then is definitely bi'ithnillah saved from the punishment of everything that comes after that. Khalas is all good. And who's not saved from this? Allahu alam. He might be saved from that which is after. 
and he might fall into that which is after we ask Allah Azza wa to save us. Very important, this, yani, alhamdulillah, that this is a dhikr that is from among al-adhkar al-sabah al masa so that you're repeating it every single day at least twice. طيب. عذاب في النار وعذاب في القبر. Our last commentary here is this. عذاب. See that tanween? في القبر وعذاب في النار. That tanween implies two things. So you can understand what you're asking. It implies التهويل والتقليل. What does that mean? التهويل implies greatness and severity. This tanween, it implies greatness and severity. So when you say, Rabbi a'udhu bika min a'thabin fi nari wa a'thabin fi al-qabr, you are saying, my Lord, I seek your protection from the intense and severe and horrific nature of the punishment of the fire and the grief. You see, you're in that tanween, you're recognizing the horrific nature and the severe nature of the punishment of Allah in the grief and in the hellfire. So you're saying, oh Allah, protect me from that. And the other implication is taqlil. This tanween, at the same time, subhanAllah, how beautiful the Arabic language is, it implies littleness. Littleness. So in context, what that means is you're saying, my Lord, I seek your protection from even the slightest, tiniest, minutest form of punishment of the grave and the hellfire. Not even this much, I don't want to see. Nothing. Not at all. Right? Even the heat of the fire, I don't want to feel that. This is how beautiful this is. So on one end, it's highlighting the intense nature of the punishment. And on the other hand, you're asking Allah, a small bit of it, I don't want. And the one who's seeking Allah's protection from this every morning and every evening, then most definitely he's going to die either during the day or during the night. He would have died while his last words were, Oh Allah, save me from the punishment of the grave, the punishment of the fire. Such a person, bi-ibnillah, is saved from these punishments. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we conclude this lesson. Jazakum Allahu khayra. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een.